Good evening to you again. This is lesson number 15 in our study. Just one more to go after tonight. And uh, uh, if you would, uh, turn in your uh, notes there to page 26 uh, under 1 Timothy chapter 3. I do want to mention that if I can get through with the qualifications of the elder, I don't think that I will get through with all of them tonight. And uh, I have some hard decisions to make as to how we're going to finish up. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, the controversial issue of whether or not a woman can be a deacon, a deaconess. And uh, I think a lot of that is it, we need to know how we're going to handle the scripture because there's some kind of technical issues there that we need to resolve or that need to be resolved. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll have time to do that. Uh, it, it's either that or to talk about, uh, I'm not going to talk about deacons at all. I'm going to leave that up to you to read the notes. Uh, you're welcome to do that. It's an important issue and there's some uh, other, it's not just the qualifications that we look at. The reason that I have chosen not to talk about them is because I think that the majority of the, of the qualifications for the elder and the deacon are the same except that the elder is apt to teach. So rather than re repeating a lot of those qualifications to you, I'll let you just read those if you choose. And then the last section, verse 14 through 16, deals with the church being the pillar and the ground of the truth, which in my mind is probably a lot more uh, significant issue than the issue of deaconesses, but I don't think that that's going to cause any conflict in a church. The, the, sec the first issue... Uh, certainly can and if you don't know how to handle that if you're not very adept or, or you don't understand some of the technical things that are said here I think it can create some problems some unnecessary unnecessary problems I'd imagine in most of your churches it's an, it's not an issue but it is an issue it actually became very divisive I think in um, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention and they actually had a a split in the convention uh, on that one issue and uh, they created I think I think it's called the fellowship um, uh, it's a wing of the Southern Baptist Convention called the fellowship something and they are are fairly uh, they're they're a little more liberal in their theology uh, than the Southern Baptist would be and I think uh, this issue they, one of the issues here was created, uh, was the idea of whether or not a church can have women deacons. So we, we'll talk about that as if, if I get a chance. If not, you can read the notes and uh, hopefully they'll be helpful to you. I want to pick up here at the bottom of page 26. Uh, we're talking about being blameless. The qualification obviously is not talking about perfection because there are no perfect people. There is no, um, there, there, there is nothing that relates to perfection in in the process of sanctification it's the goal but it's certainly not necessarily something that we are going to achieve the qualification is talking about godliness is talking about character and every leader every it doesn't matter who they are every leader is going to have faults there are going to be areas of their life that are uh, where they have made mistakes have made poor judgments they uh, maybe have not been diligent in some areas, um, and there are going to be plenty of areas that need maturing, and that's good. That's great. I, I mean, we ought to always be growing in the Lord, uh, but Paul is not talking about those kind of issues. He's talking about those areas of a leader's life that, for whatever reason, are tainted with an area of disgrace, of ill, ill you know, something that just uh, is dishonoring to Christ, uh, something that is, is, is demeaning to the actual work that the individual is in, in, involved in. And it's the kind of sin in a person's life, uh, a habit, where uh, someone could point uh, to that leader and say, hey, hey, um, uh, in, in, you know, they could, they could accuse him and discredit both him and his church. I know of a man uh, that was a pastor of a church, uh, unfortunately, and there were a lot of areas of his life that simply did not meet these qualifications, and yet the church allowed him to continue 
uh, in the ministry. He was very uh, charismatic. He had he had uh, a lot of uh, you know charismatic type qualities about him, and and, uh, and 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 for that reason, he was able w with his tongue, if I can use that term, to sort of override any objections that people had against him. And, and uh, later on in uh, his ministry, uh, I wouldn't even call it a ministry, I would call it a charade, uh, the members of the church found out that in the evenings, that late in the evenings, is that he would, he would leave his home. I mean, we're talking about leaving at, you know, one or two o'clock in the morning, and I mean, he's got a family and the whole nine yards, and he would go to a one of the one of the adult uh, uh, bookstores, whatever they call them, where you can get videos and, and watch bit you know pornographic videos. I mean, I, I mean, you can just imagine the devastating effect that that would have on on an individual's reputation from the outside as well as on his church. Certainly, doesn't say much for the church. And uh, there, there's some sins, I, 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 we're not going to get into them, uh, which an elder, and overseer could have committed in the past, which obviously mar his reputation and just disqualify him from the ministry. Uh, one example would just, I think, be moral infidelity in his marriage. I know of another uh, local pastor who um, had an affair with his associate pastor's wife. Um, that's not a good thing. That's not a healthy thing. That's obviously something that is um, disqualified him from the ministry, which he which he he got out of the ministry because of that. Uh, I know of some men who have been caught in adultery, uh, begged for forgiveness, church gave it, and they're, they're still in the ministry. I think that's wrong. That's unscriptural. Uh, there might be, you know, one thing might be, a, a, one attribute may be a, a man who struggles with anger all the time. He, he can't, con you know, if a man struggles with anger, it's because he lacks self-control. And if he lacks self-control in one area, you know he's going to lack self-control in, er in another area. And, but you can just imagine somebody being angry and, and uh, you know, being in a public setting uh, and, and getting upset and saying things that he shouldn't say, it gives the lost person the opportunity to point the finger at them, to point the finger at the church, to point the finger at Christ. Listen, you have to be qualified. It, a man has to be qualified to be, to be uh, a, a, an elder in a, in, a, in a local church. He has to be a model. And so... Um, Philippians chapter 3 verse 17 says brethren join in following my example this was Paul's exhortation and his encouragement to his members uh, he says and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern I mean he was encouraging them to actually follow him and to follow his example I think every good pastor ought to be able to say that to his people I, I think that's a responsibility in his part uh that he can be a good example of a father, of a husband, of a leader, of just what it means to be a follower of Christ, to be, uh, uh, to have a zeal for the things of God, to be evangelistic and have some fervor about that, uh, to be uh, a good steward of his resources, all those kind of things. Uh, so I think a congregation is responsible. I think they're responsible to follow godly leaders. Hebrews 13, 7 and 17 say, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Obey those who rule over you. Be submissive. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy, not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Now, the following are several observations relative to leadership okay we have we, we obviously have more qualifications to look at but these are just some observations relative to being a leader in a church and what that means 
Sometimes, I, I think, first of all, that godly leaders often become the target of Satan's specific work and often can be subjected to more severe temptations than others. I think the enemy is very... You know, I, I certainly don't believe that, uh, uh, that that Satan is everywhere, that he's omnipotent or omnipresent. He, he's, he can only be one place at one time. You know, he's, he's not... He's not all powerful. He certainly has, uh, as an angel, they certainly have some kind of abilities that uh, exceed what we have. But he can only, he's just limited. He's only one place at one time. But his emissaries and those that he sends out certainly would target uh, pastors. If they can discredit pastors, if they can get them to do something in their life that would be inappropriate, then they can discredit a lot of things. And I think that they become the special, uh, pastors become special targets. Um, you know, those people that are on the front lines during a spiritual battle are the ones that encounter the strongest attacks of the enemy. You know, if you've ever seen anything on TV or look, watched any of the document, the documentaries, uh, the documentaries of, of when the Marines stormed the beaches there at Normandy and other places, I mean, many of them just, just, I mean, just more than we want to talk about were killed because they got, they were the ones that were on the, in the forefront, the ones that were there actually fighting. They were the ones that were the target of the attack and they uh, suffered the greatest casualties simply because they were at the forefront of the battle. And I think that any good pastor is somebody that's at the forefront of the battle. He's going to be experiencing severe temptations at times. And he has to know that. It's not just that the church knows that. It's this that it's that the pastor knows that. It, it, he appreciates that he has been placed into that position. Um, and he has to be aware that there are going to be temptations in his life that where the enemy it, it, it just wants him to nibble at them until they become a stronghold and eventually something that could destroy his ministry. Uh, when godly leaders fall, they bring about great harm on God's church or they have that potential. And because a godly ge leader gen generally has a greater knowledge of the word, the truth, and of their accountability, they often bring greater chastening on their life. I think David in the Old Testament would be a clear example of that. Uh, you know, he, he committed a, 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 a sin with Bathsheba and the discipline and the chastening that God brought in on his life about a year later when Nathan the prophet came to him was so severe. And it wasn't just that he was disciplined, it was that there were many people that were a part of Israel that lost their lives because of that sin in his life. Not to, can, not to mention the person that he actually murdered um, and so godly leaders um, uh, if they're going to protect themselves they they have to spend time quality time studying the word first timothy chapter 4 verse 6 says if you instruct the brethren in these things you'll be a good minister of jesus christ nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed so any good leader has to constantly be exposing his life to the Word of God, allowing the Word of God to enrich him, allowing the Word of God to strengthen him, allowing the Word of God to teach him and, and be an encouragement to him. He has to do that if he's going to be on the front lines. You don't want anybody on the front lines that's protecting the people behind them uh, to not know what they're doing, to not be well equipped. You know, to not have the right, the, the right um, uh, weapons uh, to protect. Uh, that's why they're there. The next characteristic that we want to review is the qualification that the elder must be the husband of one wife. Now, I, I want to say that in my mind, um, this qualification has been very, very divisive. It, it really is a very divisive issue. In churches and and uh, ho hopefully we'll talk a, a little bit about that 
here. I think of all the qualifications that we're going to talk about, this is the one that's the most controversial. This is the one that is the most debated. And within Baptist churches, this one phrase has been the cause of much division. I know a local church in the area in which I lived, a fairly large church, uh, that had a significant, you know, was having a significant impact on its community. And they had a, a man who um, was a very godly man. He was a great friend of mine, actually. Very godly man. And he, he, um, he, had, he had gotten married at an early age. I'm going to say 18, 19 years old. Uh, just on a whim. This was way before he was saved. This was a long time before he was I say a long time, but it was a good number of years before he was saved. And he and his wife, uh, she left him after about two weeks. And the next thing you know, I mean, so he wound up getting a divorce. And, uh, and then he got saved and became one of the most godly men that you would ever meet in your life. I mean, you couldn't find a more godly, astute man a student of God's Word. He had an incredible wife. He loved his wife. She was, she was uh, uh, just a beautiful Christian. And, uh, but he was, uh, he was a deacon in, in that local church. And, and uh, somebody found out, I, guess, I think he just told them, and, and, and next thing you know, it, it created a firestorm. Uh, they asked him to be removed. And eventually, it split the church. Now, that's not a good thing. That, that's not the way that that is to work. And so, there are many Baptist churches, probably most Baptist churches, that take the position that if a man has been divorced for any reason, either prior to or after salvation, then that individual is not qualified to be in a position of leadership. That, that's a very prevalent, very prevalent uh, um, uh, way that churches approach this particular issue. And normally that position is based on the phrase, the husband of one wife. In other words, the way that the phrase is interpreted is that the man could never have more than one wife, ever. Uh, even though there are numerous situations that could have led to this, let's just say, for instance, the man's wife died. Um, she died, let's just say for instance, uh, he was a godly man and they were, uh, uh, he was a deacon in his church and, and um, uh, they were in an unfortunate automobile accident, uh, you know, maybe they were 38, 39, um, the wife gets killed and several years later he gets remarried. Well, there's some churches that would take the position that that man, because he now has a second wife, cannot be a deacon. I don't think that's a very good handling of the scriptures. That's just my opinion, and I'll tell you why. Obviously, an overseer elder has to be above reproach, but especially in relation to women. You know, I have a, a saying that I, I have taught my church, and, and I mention it quite often in, in, uh, in different classes, and it's that it, there are three things that 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 a leader cannot touch. If he touches any one of these, it's my opinion that God will remove his hand from that individual. He, he, cannot, uh, he cannot touch the money, he cannot touch the women, and he cannot touch the glory. Now, and, and so, I'm not saying that a man can't hug a woman. That's not, the, that's not what I'm saying here. Um, what I'm saying is that, is that he cannot be involved in some way emotionally with another woman. Um, uh, but uh, uh, anybody that's going to be a leader has to be above reproach in relation, in, in the, relative to the issue of moral sense. There, there's an indelible reproach. I don't even know how to describe it. It simply is an indelible a reproach that is placed on a man's life uh, once he commits a moral, a moral sin in his life. 
And in order to properly understand this phrase, I think we have to understand what is presented here in the Greek text. The Greek text is mias gunakos andra. And it literally means one woman man. The word mias means one. The word gunakos means woman. And andra means man. That's the phrase. That's what's in the Greek text. It's not the husband of one wife. It is a one woman man. And so it literally should read, I mean, I think that the best translation would be that it's, he's a one woman man or he's the man of one woman. The Greek phrase refers specifically to a man who is totally devoted to his wife. His eyes, his heart are focused on her. Paul is not referring to a leader's marital, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> he's not referring to a leader's marital status. He is referring to a leader's moral status. Uh, now, one cannot state from the Greek text that it is referring to divorce. It's not there. It just simply is not in the language. It's not... If, let's say, for instance, a, a man has been divorced. Now, you know the question is going to come up as to whether or not he can be a deacon. I just have given you an example of an occasion where a man was divorced. He was divorced prior to salvation, and the church said, no, you cannot be a deacon. Um, and so... Um, uh, pe people may make it mean that, Okay, but that is not in the text. So if you're going to be a good expositor of a passage and you're going to exegete that passage carefully, what you cannot do is you cannot read into that passage what you want it to mean or what you think it means. Okay? You have to take that passage and let it say what it says. It's talking here specifically about a, a man who is a one woman man. He, he doesn't have eyes for everybody else, everything that wears a dress. He's not that at all. He is completely, totally devoted to his wife. Now, I, I want to bring to your attention, uh, your attention to something that for the most part is not understood by most. And I, and I think that because it is not understood, that many people have wrongly interpreted this verse. It is a purely grammatical issue. It's just a grammatical issue, okay? It's not a moral issue. It's, it's a grammatical issue. Um, the two nouns in the Greek phrase, gonakos, woman, and andra, man, are without the definite article. Um, what that means in the construction of a Greek phrase is that it is emphasizing the individual's character or their nature, okay? This is very important. This is very critical. This is one of those areas where if you're not a good student, you're going to miss the very meaning of a passage, and you're going to, you're going to come up with some kind of teaching that really is not biblical. I mean, this could be anywhere in the Scriptures. We're not just talking about here. We're talking about being a good student of everything it is that you are teaching. You know, I, stu I literally study out of the Greek text. Uh, you know, when I'm studying a passage, when, when I'm uh, meditating on it, reading it, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I have enough Greek tools, I have enough information on the Greek language, enough uh, textbooks on Greek, that it, when I don't understand something, I can go to the text, I mean, I can go to my uh, textbooks, I can go to my tools that I have, I can read on it, and I can understand what it is. So when you go and you find out what a present participle is, it's going to tell you that it's referring to the nature of a person or to their character. So whatever it's being said, it, it's talking about character uh, in this particular case, is that it's not emphasizing the individual status, and in this case, that's why we would say that it's not emphasizing marital status. It's just because of the simple fact that it is a present participle. 
and that's a that that's a that, that's a very Im, I'm sorry. Um, it's without the definite article. I I don't know what I I got mixed up there. Please forgive me. Just adjust it. So uh, the average person reading this passage would never ever know that. I'm I, you know if I was reading it and I came to that and I just reading into English and and I had never read it before. There's no way that I would actually know that. The, the translators put words in, in uh, you know, to help us understand what something is actually saying. So the conclusion that they may logically arrive at is that if a person has been divorced for any reason, especially if you translated uh, here uh, the husband of one wife, uh, if... If they've been divorced for any reason at any time, then they can never serve in a position of leadership. And that is the wrong conclusion based on the intent of the Greek language. The, the fact <coughs> that the article <coughs> does not appear in front of each one of those nouns indicates that it is talking specifically about the individual's character. The entire passage is dealing with character, and you cannot lose sight of that. Listen to what Kenneth Wee states in his word studies in the Greek New Testament, volume 2. He says, The entire context is one in which the character of the bishop is being discussed. Since character is emphasized by the Greek construction, the bishop should be a man who loves only one woman as his wife. It should be his nature to isolate and centralize his love. Now here's a Greek scholar. Here's a man, Dr. Kenneth Wiest. If you've got his study, uh, you know, uh, Wiest Word Studies. Uh, he's In volume two is the commentary on 1 Timothy. And when he gets to this, this is the comment that he makes relative to that. There are many men who have only been married one time, but they're not a one-woman man. They have eyes for everybody, for anything that wears a dress, they cannot keep them. You remember, I, I told you about the man that I knew that um, was a was a, a, a deacon in a church, became the uh, 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 the chairman of the deacons in that church, and he had he had pornographic magazines in his house. Uh, the only reason I know that is because his son had communicated that. To me, he was very upset about it. He just he didn't think it was right, and so uh, you know, just because a, mar a man has only been married one time, is not an indication of that individual's moral purity. Uh, you know, there are a lot of men who who who've only been married once, or I mean, who are have only they, they're still married, uh, you know, to their wife. Uh, that's the only wife they've ever had. And yet they are, they have areas of infidelity in their life. They may look at pornography in their life, a lot of different things. In fact, I would say that it is this moral issue, the, this moral issue that we're talking about here, that has put more men out of the ministry than any other issue. Uh, and so uh, you, you have to meet this qualification. It's not talking about marital status okay it's it's a character it's the greek construction constrains it to be talking about character it, it's talking about a man's character and it, it, it be quite honest with you it fits with everything else that we're reading about an el elder and his qualifications and even that of a deacon whether it's here or, or in titus so these are, are issues of character that Paul is addressing. And I think this qualification appears at the forefront of both lists here in 1 Timothy 3, directly after the general qualification of being above reproach. It would appear that the placement of it in this position gives importance to the issue of both marital and sexual faithfulness in the marriage relationship. Um, I mean, to me, this is one of those areas where you have to you, you have to just look at the scriptures and see what it's actually saying, what the author is trying to communicate. And obviously the phrase is referring to the faithfulness 
of a husband towards his wife. He must be a one woman man. In other words, there can't be any other women in his life. I have other women in my life, my daughter and my granddaughters and my daughter-in-law, and I love them, and they're, they're incredible women in, in my life. I love the women at my church. I, they're, they're the most precious, uh, saintly people. Uh, I love uh, the wives of those that are my interpreters in Romania. I've come to know them over the years. We brought both of them, uh, both the man and his wife, over here to the United States to spend a couple weeks with us. Uh, you know, they're just incredible, incredible women, and, 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 and I honor them. But I only have eyes for my wife. I love my wife. I, I, you know, I, I, one of the greatest discoveries that I ever had in my life is when I realized that I could love my wife like Christ loved the church. That, that was what God wanted for me to do. And every man that's going to be in the ministry has to be a man that has this unique faithfulness to his wife. You know, I'm uh, 66 years old, and... And I still open the door for my wife. She cannot get out of the car. My wife is so well trained that if I don't come open the door for her, uh, uh, either way, either getting into the car, uh, the truck, or getting out of it, uh, she, if, if, if we come to church, for, for instance, and I just got out of the truck, started walking to come in, she would, still, she would remain in the truck. I mean, she's, that well she's not going anywhere until I come get her. If, if we're leaving church, I, I, this has happened before where I, I just forgot for whatever reason and I got in the truck and I look over there and she's standing outside the truck waiting for me to come get her. Uh, you, you know, I, I honor my wife. I, I want to honor my wife. I told her, I said, I, I, this is the way I told her. I said the Queen of England would never, uh, you know, open the door for herself. Somebody always opens it up for her. The Queen of England doesn't bring her groceries in. You know, somebody else brings them in. You know, my wife comes home. We go out there and get the groceries. My son and I, we go out there and get them. We bring them in. She went and shopped and got them all. So, uh, this is talking about, this is talking about a man's faithfulness uh, to his wife. Now, uh, I, I want you to keep in mind that the issue here is not the number of times that somebody has been married. Uh, a, a man could have had two wives, both of them whom have died. In fact, if you remember in the old, in the New Testament, Jesus gave an illustration of uh, you know somebody came to him said, or the Pharisees came to him and were testing. Him. He said, "Well, what if you know a man had a wife and uh, uh, I mean uh, and the husband died and and." And, and you know they went through seven you know seven different scenarios of, of well whose wife would she be in the in the final resurrection, and so we're not talking here about the number of wives that a man may have had, but rather the issue is whether or not he is exclusively faithful to the wife that he that he that he had and he's faithful to the wife that he may now have now that. What I've just said is the point of contention, okay? Yeah, because there are a lot of Baptist churches that would say, hey, if he's had more than one wife, he can't. I mean, if, he's, if at any time in his life he was divorced, he, he, cannot, he, cannot, be, he cannot be an elder. Um, they take the position that if he's been divorced, he cannot be involved in any kind of leadership position. Under the traditional Baptist organization, that means that he could not be a pastor, he could not be a deacon, but this standard is not talking about marital status, it's talking about moral character. I am not teaching, I am not saying that being divorced is good. I am not saying that because uh, that, that everybody that gets divorced ought to be considered for positions of, of, of leadership. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, i be quite honest with you, my personal opinion about it is that if, if a person has been divorced after, after having been saved, and there are, a lot of, there are a lot of areas where the man himself could have been very faithful to his wife and his wife was unfaithful to him. And he didn't leave the marriage, she left the marriage. 
He didn't. He he wanted resolution. She wouldn't give resolution. He wanted to be reconciled. Did everything he could to be reconciled, but she didn't. So, do you want to hold him in in uh, in in uh, uh, you, you know you know penalize that man for doing everything right during the struggle in his marriage, to, uh, so that he would have a marriage that was godly, so that he would have a marriage that was uh, honoring to Christ, so that he, he did everything that he could to be reconciled. He, he went for marriage counseling, he did the whole nine yards, and he was a godly man that unfortunately had an ungodly wife. Do you, are, are we going to penalize him for that? I, in my mind, and I'm just, I'm just giving you an opinion, in my mind, that man is, is, has done the right thing. He has done everything that he could possibly have done he just had a partner that was unfaithful, and so, um, so I, I'm, 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 but I'm not teaching that being divorced is is good. I would say that the ideal, okay, that's all I'm saying, is that the ideal situation would be for a church to have leaders that have never been divorced. Now, I, I don't, I, I don't know what other churches do. I know what my church does, and we only have men. That have never been divorced. We 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 have, we have deacons, that have uh, been divorced, uh, and in each case, each of them were divorced prior to being saved. We don't have anybody in a position of leadership that has been divorced after they were saved. Okay, uh, but I'm just I gave you the example that just because somebody has been divorced doesn't mean that they didn't make every effort possible to be. Reconcile. So you can, you can, you have to be a little careful, I think, in how you're handling, handling this. Uh, let's say that a man has been divorced several times, but at the at the present moment, he's leading a fairly blameless wife. Seems to love his wife, and and uh, is it, for all practical purposes, is is a is a is a one woman man. Listen, if he's been divorced several times, even though he is a one woman man now. There have been things in his life that obviously weren't right. Uh, I, I, I mean, they just are not right. There's just something, there's something strategic missing. There's no telling that he won't be divorced again. I, I don't think that man would even be considered uh, to be in a position of leadership, even though at the present moment he was a one-woman man. I don't think that you can take the man's life away, uh, that you can separate his total life from the way that he's currently living. Even though the way he's currently living may be good, there, there may be patterns in his life that are not good, and that pattern of not having been a one-woman man, uh, of, of, of having unresolved marital issues that he was never able to resolve, I think that you, you're, you're not going to go be looking at that man to be a leader in a local church. And so uh, uh, I, I don't think that... Um, that that man is qualified for leadership. It, it's certainly not unreasonable that those in positions of leadership should be held to a higher standard. I think that's that's a, that's exactly what the scriptures are communicating to us. That those that are in a position of leadership, that they are the ones above everybody else, that have to be held to not only a high standard. I want to call it a higher standard. I don't think there, there's any qualification here that, that I, let me put it positively, I think every Christian ought to have these these attributes in their life. But if you're going to be a leader, they're even, they're even more critical. Um, and so, um, you know, there, there are plenty of men who were divorced, though, before they were even saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 speaks to the general issue of sins before, before salvation when it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things, have, I mean, all, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And, and in this verse, all things means exactly that. It means all things. You can translate it how you want to, but that's what it means. It means everything. All things. All those different areas in their past, once they got saved, those things are in the past. Uh, if I can say it this way, they don't count. 
I think some of the most godly men I know were some of the most ungodly men before they got saved. I mean, they were ungodly. God touched their life, and now they are incredibly godly men that God is using in different, different, different areas. And so those sins that somebody committed before salvation, they may continue to, to haunt somebody. They may continue to vex that person. They may hinder his walk with God. But I don't think that there are things that a church can hold that person spiritually hostage over. Let's say that a man, uh, before he got saved, that he mistreated his children. Okay? He just, uh, maybe he was a drunk and, and he mis he's an alcoholic and he mistreated his children, you know. And his children don't have anything to do with him anymore. They don't like him. He got saved. They still don't like him. They don't, you know, they're not saved. They don't think that he, is he disqualified? Uh, I don't think that you can hold him in, as a hostage spiritually to what happened before his salvation experience. Is he the best person for leadership? Well, maybe, maybe not. You know, God has to call that individual. And there has to be a time of testing. He has to meet all of the qualifications. The church has to make sure that all of this blends in with, with how they're going to function, uh, you know. And so um, we just have to be a little careful here. I, I, I praise God. I thank God that people can change. Aren't you? I, I changed. I changed. I mean, I'm, I'm as different as night is from day, uh, from before salvation to after salvation. And I'm, I'm grateful uh, that God can transform a person's life completely. Just look at somebody like Paul. Paul was a blasphemer. Uh, you know, he was a murderer of Christians, yet he became probably the greatest Christian that ever lived, and we're sitting here studying what he actually wrote. Now, here was a man who, who was as, as, as unqualified to be a leader as, as, as you could come up with, and yet, and yet God used him to be one of the greatest Christians of all times. And I think there are plenty of men who have had wives who committed sexual unfaithfulness and fornication on them, uh, and, and the men did everything they could to be reconciled, uh, but the wife just simply did not want to be married to them any, any longer. I, I know a man in a church. I, uh, I, I used to go to church with him a long time ago. Uh, he was a godly man, still is a godly man. I mean, he was, he was a wonderful father to his children. I think he was a wonderful husband to his wife, and his wife got involved in pornography. And uh, per personally, and uh, and she wouldn't stop, and he kept trying to get her to stop. She wouldn't stop, and and finally she just said, "I'm tired of you," and she divorced him and left him. He he didn't do anything wrong. I he didn't. I mean, he didn't do anything wrong. And uh, she got remarried, and and uh, uh, so you know, this is a very very uh, serious kind of issue here that we have to deal with. Um, if you take this to mean marital stat status rather than moral status, then, then if a man's been divorced for any reason, I, I, don't, I think he's completely disqualified. If you take that position, I, I think that's the wrong position. That's my personal opinion. I think, I, I, I think the scriptures are clear here that it's talking about a man's moral status and not his marital status. And if you take the position that it is a moral status issue, which I think the Greek text clearly identifies, then you have to give some credence to the fact that, that uh, a man who has been divorced, uh, but it wasn't his fault, uh, that it's not necessarily talking about him specifically. Once again, I want to I want to go on record as saying that for me the ideal for the church is to have men on their in their leadership positions where this has never ever been an issue. But by the same token, I, I, if you took somebody like Paul, 
we, we don't want to disqualify somebody and hold them as a spiritual hostage because their marriage partner was the one that had violated all of God's principles and, the, and, and this individual had done everything that they could to resolve that issue. Um, so, in 1 Corinthians chapter 17, uh, we know that Paul provided for remarriage when an unbelieving spouse in initiates a divorce. He says, but if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. Brother, sisters, not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. And we understand that God hates divorce, but obviously he is gracious to the innocent parties, to those who have done everything that they could. Re remarriage in and of itself is not a sin. And by the same token, it's not necessarily a blight on a man's character. In many cases, it is. I would say probably in more cases than not that it is. Uh, you know, marriage is a two-way street. And... Sometimes, you know, people may, may have tried to reconcile with their partner, but maybe they were the ones that, for whatever reason, had kind of initiated the problems. You know, they were unkind. They, um, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day, and it was just out of the clear blue. I mean, I'm just sitting there. I'm kind of stunned. It's just uh, someone that I knew, and, and uh, it was a lady, and she said, uh, she said, she's, we were talking about something else, and all of a sudden, just out of clear blue, she says, she says, my husband and I aren't even talking anymore. And I'm thinking, you know, I was just kind of like, well, hello, you know, I didn't know what she was talking about. And these are people that I, that I love. I, I believe they're, I mean, I know that they're Christians. They love God, and and yet they're just having some marital problems. I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I wasn't in a position to help, but I just, I mean, I knew that, uh, you know, that didn't sound good. Uh, no, there's no telling. But, but it takes two people to be married. And so I think in some cases, how somebody resolves something that's very difficult can be a very positive reflection on their character because if they say how a man handled it with a, a woman who was unfaithful. Let, let's, let's take, for instance, the man who's in the ministry and his wife dies and he remarries. I, this has happened quite often. I mean, I don't think this is unusual at all. If, if you take this husband of one wife literally, which many have, the church that I was uh, uh, talking uh, to you about that split, they took this literally. Uh, and, and they, I, I mean literally, if, if you had more than one, ever had more than one wife, you could not be in a position of leadership in, in that church. Well, if that's the case, let's say, for instance, let's just say, for instance, uh, uh, a young man ha had a wife and they had two young children. And uh, I, I know, I, I know of, of an incident like this that happened recently. A uh, very young couple, probably in their early 20s, uh, they had a daughter. And uh, the wife got... Um, she had a, a form of uh, cancer, I forget which kind it was, and, and, uh, and, and she died. I mean, she was like 20, 21 years old. And here's this man, and he's got, his wife dies, and, and he's got a young daughter, and obviously he's going to want to remarry. Uh, in fact, Paul tells the, the, young, uh, the younger girls uh, that they ought to get remarried. Uh, he says in verse 14 of chapter 5, I desire that the younger widows marry. Bear children, man, you know. I mean, he's encouraging the women there to get married. I mean, he's encouraging them to do that. And so here's this young man, his wife has died, uh, he's got a child. I would think that it would be perfectly fine for him to be to be remarried, and because of the structure of the sentence dealing with a man's character and integrity, it certainly has nothing to do. I mean, he's not disqualified from, a, from at some point in time being a leader in a church. He didn't do anything wrong. There's no integrity issues here. His wife died of cancer. Um, and so uh, the issue is always, is, is always a matter of... of 
of character and integrity. Um, let's take about uh, let's, let's take a man who's never been married. Okay, that's a good example here. Um, is he disqualified from the ministry until he gets married? I don't think so. It's not talking about that. It's not saying that a deacon or that an elder has to be married. Uh, the men that Paul is excluding here are men who are guilty of marital unfaithfulness. They don't have eyes for their wife. They're looking at anything they can. It's, it's, a, it's an integrity character issue. The man has to be true and faithful to his wife. He has to be devoted in his heart and his mind to his wife. He has to love her. He has to desire her. He has to think only of her. He has to maintain uh, sexual purity both in his thought life and in his physical life, his conduct. It's important to emphasize that, <coughs> that sexual sin is a reproach that never goes away. It never goes away. I heard one of the most heartrending uh, 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 I, I got a call from uh, um, uh, from a lady uh, uh, about her husband and she told me what he was involved in on the internet and I was just in shock. I was in shock. Uh, because I know that the man had been a leader in a uh, 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 an elder in his church. I may, may still have been one for all I know. I, mean, I was shocked. It was just, it, it's something that I, I can't get out of my mind. It just does not go away. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6 says, Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. Wounds and dishonor he will get, and his reproach will not be wiped away. It just never goes away. So, the issue here is integrity, and it's moral integrity, moral character, not marital status. It's also important to state, without any reservation, that if a man in the ministry at any time commits a sexual or moral sin, that once he commits a sin in the area of moral impurity, that that man is disqualified for pastoral ministry any longer. He can be restored, he can be restored to fellowship, uh, he should be. Uh, he, he should be. Um, but he, he is not, he's no longer qualified to be in the ministry. Uh, sexual sin disqualifies any man in the ministry from being a leader in God's church. And I, that's something that every pastor, every person in leadership, every elder, I think every deacon needs to take into consideration if if obviously if we knew that somebody in our church in a position of leadership had, com had was sexually impure uh we we would we would they would no longer be in that position of leadership a man has to be true and faithful to his wife certainly believers would want that person to be restored and i think that they could but there's going to be a reproach there every time you see that individual you're going to be thinking about the fact, well, they were unfaithful to their, to their wife, you, you know, and uh, you, you're going to be, it's just a reproach that you don't want to have to deal with. So, uh, so even though he may be restored to fellowship, he cannot be restored back to the ministry. And uh, he's excluded from any role in the church as a pastor, an elder, overseer, deacon, and uh, if, if, if a believer, uh, not an elder, not a deacon, has at any time been unfaithful to his wife and later divorced and remarried, then extreme caution should be uh, exercised in even considering whether or not the man could be a leader. I, 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 my inclination is I, if a man's been unfaithful, that I, I, I just, even though he may have repented, uh, my tendency would be is that that's, he's not the model that God wants to be in a position of leadership in. And I don't, I don't even think that the man would be considered. Even if he came and said, well, I have a desire and my character matches all this, I, I still don't think that the church is obligated under that sense to necessarily even consider him. Um, 
every church is different. You have to approach it. Every church has to make their own decision about these kind of things. They're very, very sensitive. I'm not trying to tell you how you ought to do it in your church or how it ought to work, but I am saying there has to be some sensitivity to it, but I'm just giving you a personal opinion on my part um, that I, that if, if, if this unfaithfulness and divorce um, has happened in that person's life that it's just not probably the individual that you need to be in a strong healthy church can he be in a position of ministry I'm, we, we, I'm differing between leadership and ministry and I would say absolutely he can be in a position of ministry uh, let's say that he may actually you know develop especially in a larger church may may have an opportunity to minister to people that are going through the same thing that he went through. You know, and he's telling them how he overcame that and how God worked in his life and giving them direction and instruction as to how, how God worked and how God can work in their life. And it can be a very valuable, he can have a very val valuable opportunity in his life. But being in a position of leadership in the church, probably not. And uh, I, I would, I, you know, I, I, I want to say no. I just want to say no. But I know that there are cases where people have made terrible mistakes in their life. They have repented. They have changed. God has worked in their life. And you don't want to hold them spiritually hostage. I think that the issue, though, is not that you as an individual are holding them hostage to some sin that they committed in their life even though they have repented of that i think the issue is is that they disqualified themselves not you you didn't disqualify them they disqualified themselves from a position of leadership in the local church because of their activities they should have thought about that earlier you know there are always consequences to sin and i i think that those in positions of leadership ought to be not perfect, but they ought to actually be models that everybody can follow. You know, the two men in my church that are elders other than myself, one of the chief characteristics about those men is how much they love their wives. They are intimate. They are faithful. They love their wives. Their, their, their wives are incredibly godly women. Uh, I just love them to death. They just they have such an impact on me. I look at their life and I go, wow, th these guys are just great. Uh, their wives are just wonderful. They they are everything that I would want them to be. And but if you know either one of them had been unfaithful to their wife, and and it it would be like when I looked at them, I would not be able to say that with the same intensity that I say it about a man that I know who has been faithful to his wife all of their marriage and all of their life. And so the sin of unfaithfulness and divorce is very, very serious. And I think that during this past century that the church was focused on the battle for doctrinal purity, but in many cases they lost the battle for moral purity within the church. Obviously God has a lot to say about the character of the men that he wants leading his church. And the church must have leaders who are above reproach. And anything less is going to be an absolute disaster for the life and integrity of a local church. So what, we don't, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to be merciful. Let me back up. I'm not going to violate my convictions about the scripture here uh, and a man being disqualified. Um, and in my mind, if a man has uh, been divorced uh, for unfaithfulness, that he is disqualified, period. That just, that's, that's, uh, that's the way that I read these scriptures, even though he may be a one-woman man right now. I mean, but let me back up. If a man has been unfaithful after salvation, uh, that he is really just not qualified for leadership. And, uh, but at the same time, I want to be merciful. I, I want to be merciful. I, I, don't want, I, don't, I don't want to violate the integrity of Scripture or the qualifications of Scripture. So what I, I'm going to do, even if I err, I'm going to err on the side of saying, hey, you know, you don't even have to make it an issue. 
you know, in, in, our, in our church, I don't think this would ever be an issue. I think we would recognize we wouldn't even talk to a person about being an elder if we felt like these things had existed in their life pre previously. I, I just don't even think it would be an issue. The next characteristic that Paul mentions is that of being temperate. Um, I want to make sure that I've covered everything relative to, to this because uh, it, it's, it's, a very, it's a very controversial issue. It has divided churches. It's divided families in churches. And, uh, but I think the overriding principle is that men in positions of leadership are men whose character and integrity are above reproach. And that, and, and that, and, and we're talking about after salvation that that they have maintained moral impurity, I mean moral purity and moral integrity throughout their entire life. That's what it takes to be a leader in God's church. Uh, are there some men that have repented? Sure, absolutely. Uh, are they disqualified from leadership? Probably. Uh, I would say in, in my mind that they that, that you didn't disqualify them. God disqualified them because of their, they, they just were not, a, a, they may be a one woman man now. They may only have eyes for their wife. They regret what they did. They regret, you know, they regret it deeply. But they are, are that they're just basically not the person for the job. And uh, that's not to diminish them as a person. It is to elevate the position of an elder and uh, so I'll let you wrestle with that bear some if you want to. Um, but I do want you to appreciate, I think you should appreciate, especially if you're going to be in a pastoral role, especially if you're uh, in certain denominations, you're going to find that this is a very, very controversial issue. And you need to at least have some what I would call some, uh, you, you need to understand what the term one woman uh, man means. Uh, I mean, the husband of one wife, what that actually means. It means a one woman man. It's talking about moral status and not marital status. That's really the issue here. The next characteristic that Paul mentions is that uh, of being temperate, which literally means wineless or unmixed with wine. Um, you know, back then they, they would add uh, wine to the water, just, you know, they would dilute it, dilute the water, uh, normally eight parts water with one part wine. When I go to Romanian Zimbabwe, I never drink the water, ever, ever. I never drink water out of a well, uh, out of, uh, I just never do that. Uh, my, they got flora in their water and bacteria that I'm not used to. Next thing I know, I have dysentery. I will have everything I don't want while I'm there, and uh, and I'm just not going to. We we take bottled water with us. We buy bottled water when we get there. And so, Proverbs chapter 20 says, "Wine is a mocker; strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise." Leviticus 10.9 forbids the priest from drinking wine when they were performing their priestly duties, and those who took the Nazarite vow could not drink wine at all. I mean, you got to think about that for a minute. The priests were allowed to drink wine, but they couldn't do it when they were performing their priestly duties. Now, they, here, here's what would happen is that they would only go in for a certain time. As a priest, they'd go perform their duties, they would do it for their 30 days, and that would be it. They would be gone. You know, there's the high priest, and uh, but most of the priests that came from the tribe of Levi, they, they would go, you know, there were a lot of them. I mean, they were of that tribe, and they would go in by, by groups uh, certain times of the year, you know, this group, that group, but once you served uh, and you did your service there, uh, that was pretty much it. So when they were doing that, they, they could not be 
you know, drinking wine and all that. And, but then a person who was to be fully committed to God in another area, the Nazarite couldn't drink wine at all. Now, I don't drink wine. I don't drink beer. I don't drink alcohol. I don't think that anybody that's involved in the ministry ought to. Certainly there are denominations that don't believe that. They don't agree with that. They, they drink whatever they want to. I, I'm not. I'm not, uh, you know, if I can say it this way, uh, you know, I, it's like being a Nazarite. Uh, you know, I just have a, a higher standard. I hope you have a higher standard as, as well. Uh, it says in Proverbs 31, 4, that kings and other rulers were to abstain from drinking because it could dull their judgment. And in a metaphorical or figurative sense, the word carries the idea of being alert, of being watchful, of being clear-headed. That's what it means to be temperate. And Paul speaks later in verse 3 of not being given to wine. And so this, in my mind, may be the actually, actually the preferred meaning. Is that it's being somebody that's watchful, somebody that's alert, somebody that's clear-headed about things. Uh... You know, if you, if you have somebody in a position of leadership and they are constantly reacting to everything that takes place in a church or something somebody said, they're not re they don't really have this quality of, of being temperate. I, I don't think that they even come close to having this particular quality because they have, um, they have, they just are uh, not, uh, they're reacting to things. They're 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 not being uh, uh, you know clear-headed about it and thinking through things. Uh, you know I say it all the time. Don't react. Just respond. Don't, you know don't get uptight with everybody about everything that happens. You know you gotta you gotta determine what hill you're gonna die on, and don't make an issue of everything and just just work through things. Uh, you're, you're gonna be a lot more comfortable. Your people will be a lot more relaxed if you'll figure all that out in, in, in your ministry. And so a leader has to be somebody who, who, who's able to think clearly, somebody that has a good head on their shoulders and who works through the issues. There are always going to be issues. And they're always, it doesn't matter what kind of church you have, doesn't matter how good your church is, doesn't matter how healthy it is, there are always going to be those things that you have to work through in a church. It's e it is easy, and especially in our culture, uh, to have very time-consuming bad habits that, not, that don't really contribute to a person's spiritual life. It, it, I, know I love to play golf, but if I played every day, it would be a tremendous hindrance to, to, my, to, to, you know, to the ministry. I don't play every day. I don't play every week. I, I, there are times when I don't play in a month, but that doesn't mean that I don't like to play. Uh, and... Uh, and, and when I do get to play, I like to play with other Christians. I, I love playing golf with my sons. It's relaxing. Uh, I love when I can beat them. You know, they're, they're much younger and stronger than I am, and, and yet I can, I can keep pace with them. Uh, you know, one son I, I beat most all the time, and the other son I probably beat every three out of ten times that we would play. And it's kind of, it's kind of enjoyable, you know. I like, I, I like being able to take on the younger guns there. But I, I, it, it's not something that I can devote my life to. I can't be consumed with going out every day. You know, we have a big field. It's about seven or eight acres. We, we live on about 200 acres, and we have this big field in front of our house, and it's just centipede. It's about seven acres of centipede grass, and it's a great place for me to go out and, and just kind of hit some balls. You know, we got hundreds of golf balls, and... I can just go out and hit balls and stuff. I can't remember the last time that I did that. I, I mean, it's been, we're talking years. It might be a decade since I took a golf ball and went out into the uh, fields and, and hit it. Why? Because I just don't have time. I'm not going to be consumed with, with just, I'm not going on the pro tour. I'm not going to be a, you know, a golf professional. I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I'm not going to. I'm not going to enter into tournaments. I, I just. I just enjoy it, and I enjoy doing other things too. I enjoy walking, <clears throat> and so a, a leader has to be clear-headed enough to understand 
what his ultimate priorities are in his life. The next term is sober-minded. It means to be orderly, sensible. I like this idea of being self-disciplined, self-controlled, and of a sound mind. Um, Dr. Il DeFonso, um, who, who's one of the other online professors, and you certainly will enjoy his courses, uh, he always describes me as a self-learner. Uh, he, he's, uh, he's, you know, we'll be somewhere, and that's the term that he will use to describe me to somebody else. He'll say, he'll say, Gary's a self-learner. He's, he's, uh, he just, he has the discipline. He knows what he has to do uh, to be a teacher. He studies. It's, he, you don't have to prompt him. He just has that discipline in his life. And so a, a leader is somebody who's well-disciplined. He's just well-disciplined, and he knows how to order his priorities. You have got to have priorities. If you don't have, a, if you don't have priorities in your life, everything will become your priority. You'll just be inundated with a thousand things to do. People will be pulling on you, trying to get you to do this, do that, and, and ultimately, you will lose sense of where you are in the ministry. I have priorities. I do not violate those priorities. I give the time that I need to. Uh, there are just times when I'm studying. My wife knows I'm locked in. I am locked in uh, uh, in, my, in my study at home. I study at home. And... Uh, and, uh, and she doesn't bring me phone calls, uh, anything. I'm just locked in. Do not bother me. I have a time in the morning that I guard with great intensity of just getting up and spending time. Uh, uh, I just read. I just read. I take notes. I have a journal. Just, just write down things. I mark things in my Bible that I believe that God is uh, helping me. I don't... Uh, I don't like to read with a lot of writing, but I, I might underline something, you know. I don't want to get distracted with what I learned last year. I want to learn something new this year. And so um, you've got to have some discipline in your life. You've got to know what your priorities are. You've got to be very serious about your spiritual life. You've got to be serious about spiritual matters. You have to be. This is not something that you and I can just kind of ignore and just... You know, it just be up and down. Uh, that's not how any of this works at all. Uh, you have to be very serious about these things. Uh, I, we have to live, you know, we live in a world uh, where the, the, the reality is, is that people are lost. And they're disobedient to God. They're bound for eternal destruction. And if that is the case, it leaves little room for any frivolity in the ministry. I don't like, I know this is going to sound arrogant on my part. I know that this is going to sound arrogant. But I don't enjoy, personally, being around men in the ministry who are giddy about everything. I, I know that's a little, I know that's a little overbearing on my part. I know, I know that. But I just don't enjoy it. I mean, it's just a personal thing. I, when I get around somebody that is in the ministry I want to be, I, I don't mean that you can't have fun, you can't laugh about things, certainly you should, but there are just some people who are, just, they just seem to be giddy about everything. They, there's, a, there, there's a kind of sobriety, a spiritual sobriety that just seems to be missing in their life. And, I, you know, it's not something that you can just put your finger on all the time. It's just like something is missing in their life. I, you know, I would hope if, Someday, let's just say, for instance, that we met at graduation and you were graduating and you came and, and uh, in your cap and gown and, and we had an opportunity uh, to just spend some time together uh, during those two or three days that you were there, that we, I, we would, uh, you would, you, you would say, well, you know, uh, Pastor Gary, he's just as sober-minded here as he is when he's teaching. Uh, he just is, uh, you know, he's not frivolous. He, he's not just 
lighthearted about everything. At the same time, I don't want to be just sober and somber and just kind of a deadpan about life. That's not it at all. But there's just something about the spiritual life that requires a level of, of personal sobriety. Not a kind of numbness about the Christian life, but just a sobriety that's real and, and, that's, and that's prevalent in the individual's life. Uh, I think the, the word here implies that the man is cautious and he's not rash in his judgment. He's just not making... He's sober-minded. He, he's he's, he's sober-minded. That's, that's what it means. Next is the phrase of good behavior. Um, um, once again, the word carries the idea of being orderly, of leading an orderly life. Uh, you just have to be disciplined. The, the ministry and leadership in the church is no place, there's no place in, in it for a man for his life to just be uh, under constant confusion, never accomplishing anything, never meeting any goals. Uh, you know, we, we had a, 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 a men's meeting a, a while back, and, uh, and I just outlined some goals for, for our church and, and for the men, specifically for them, uh, apart from the women, and uh, just things that they needed to, to concentrate on. I know that this uh, past Sunday when I was teaching that I had, uh, we were talking about, uh, we were in Hebrews, but we were talking about Jeremiah chapter 17, I think it's verse 10, where it says the Lord tests the hearts, you, you know. Uh, he, 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 I mean, the Lord looks at the heart, He tests the mind, and we were talking about motives, and I said, I got to have some goals in my life. I, I came up with, uh, provided eight of them for them, uh, eight goals and eight motives. You, you know, I, I, this is my goal, but this is the reason I'm doing it. I want my motive to be just as important as the goal. I don't want to be doing the right thing for the wrong reason. I want to be doing the right thing for the right reason, and I have to identify all of that. And so a leader has to have order and discipline in his life. Uh, in fact, this word here, the Greek word, is actually the opposite of the word chaos. And it deals with the outward expression of a person's inward self-control. Uh, I've known so many men that were just so ineffective in the ministry because they were so disorganized. Um, I've, I've, I've known, I know this is going to sound crazy, I've known some men whose ministry was ineffective because they were too organized. Everything revolved around their organization. Uh, I think you ought to be organized. I, I just think that you should be. Uh, you know, if you looked at my library at home, uh, it's organized. It's organized in a certain way. It, it has the technical tools and the word studies, and it has all the commentaries arranged properly. You know, I start at Matthew, go all the way through Revelation, just got tons of commentaries. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I have a tendency to study without commentaries. I know in the word studies that I'm doing here I've used uh, 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 probably the primary uh, source of information comes from John MacArthur's uh, uh, commentary that's your textbook but I can assure you that I've gone out and I've studied under Vines and Strong's and Zodiates and Wren's and uh, the theological word book of the New Testament, and I mean, I must have 15 different texts that I use to study from, and they all have a lot of information, a lot of insight, and uh, uh, so there just has to be some organization uh, in, in a person's life. There are a lot of people that are just so disorganized. They don't, they don't, they are, they're all the time losing their day. They're not, they're not, they're, they're not, they don't have time to study. And they just wait to the last minute at Saturday evening, you know, at 6 o'clock, they're sitting down to kind of get, get a message together for the next morning, and they can wing it. I, I am not interested in winging anything. I, I'm not interested, I like to eat wings, but I'm not going wing, to wing anything in the ministry. And so, you know, they, because they're so disorganized, invariably they cannot 
concentrate on a task long enough to accomplish the task. They get, they get distracted by everything that comes along. And I think personally that this kind of, this kind of behavior in a man's life disqualifies him. I think the scriptures disqualify him from being an elder in a local church. Next, an elder is to be hospitable. Um, the word literally means to have a lot of love for strangers. It does not refer to entertaining friends, even though that's not a bad thing. I would say that my wife has a tremendous, uh, she has a, I, I, I don't want to call it a gift, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to call it the gift of hospitality, but she's an incredibly hospitable person. Uh, our home is just constantly, we have people that come and visit with us. Uh, I was sharing with a guy yesterday, he had come out to do our termite inspection on our home. And uh, I, he was wearing something on his uh, head, one of the little wristbands, and I, I, it indicated to me that he was probably a believer, and I asked him about it, and we were talking, and he was, and he was sharing with me a lot of uh, different things, where, you know, where he went to church and uh, different ministries that he was involved in, and he mentioned that uh, he, he was involved in a prison ministry somewhere. And so we started talking, I said, you know, I was involved in a prison prison ministry for many years and I would go uh, three times a week to the prison go on Tuesday night, Friday night and Sunday afternoon and I would teach another guy that went with me and uh, he, he led in the music really really gifted musician and over the years uh, that we did that we had a lot of prisoners that at, when they got out would actually come and live with us we opened up our home to them uh, my children were young, you know, it, it, these were young prisoners, they were like, you know, anywhere from 17 to 20 years old, something like that, and most of them probably 18 or 19, and, and, uh, and when they got, you know, they got saved in prison and, and uh, had, you know, came to the Bible studies consistently, and when they got out, they really didn't have anywhere to go, and, uh, I mean, some of them didn't, and we brought them in, and they lived with us. Um, we had uh, one, one of the guys live with us for two years. We had help him get jobs, help him get transportation, uh, just get him set up as best we could. They'd get out on their own, and I still hear from him. I had a guy that uh, came to see me uh, a couple months ago. Uh, he had been, uh, he'd got, he'd, he'd been saved uh, under that ministry, and this is 30, 35 years ago. And, and he, still, he still keeps in touch with me. Uh, we had one guy live with us for two years. He became like a son. We had a lady that lived with us for two years, a, a young girl that lived with us for two years. And um, uh, I did, uh, we were the best man and best woman in her wedding. I mean, it was just wonderful. You know, um, it just our home has always been set up for people to come and to be there. And I think anybody who's an elder, it has to be a people person. He has to deal with people. He has to, he has to be likable. You know, you don't want to have a leader that's just not likable and people don't like him. And part of that, I think, comes from the idea of, of having, uh, uh, you know, being very hospitable. Luke chapter 14 kind of expresses the idea when it says that he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. When you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. We had five prisoners that lived with us at one time. Five. Five men that lived with us at one time. We paid for everything. We we gave we bought them food. We uh, we got them clothes. Uh, we helped them get transportation. We got them on their feet. And I think that that is. I'm not saying for you to bring a prisoner into your house. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that I think that being hospitable is not just having your best friends over all the time. Or going to play golf with your best friends. I don't, I don't think that's what it means at all. It means 
that you're really taking strangers that you're you're not you're 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 willing to help strangers. I'm not telling you to pick up hitchhikers, but there's just going to be times in your life where you need to demonstrate some hospitality. In the day when Paul wrote this injunction, there were multiple things that abounded. You can just imagine there was persecution that was just everywhere for the Christians. The book of Hebrews is very strong in that. There was poverty uh, because people had become Christians in the Jewish, in the Jewish culture if they were if they became a Christian, they got desynagogued, which meant that nobody, uh, if they had a job, people fired them. Uh, if they had a business, nobody would buy from them. So that's, if you go back and you read in Acts chapter 2, where they, 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 they had all things in common, well, it only makes sense because they were going through, they'd been desynagogued, they were being persecuted. Uh, a lot of them, they were, they were learning how to live together and how to share together. And uh, there, there were a lot of them were, became slaves. There were orphans. There were widows. There were people that traveled. They didn't have hotels and and Holiday Inn Expresses and you know, you know Clarion and all these different places that you can go and stay. There were no Marriott hotels and all of that kind of stuff. You know, there wasn't even an inn for Jesus, for mother and father to stay in before he was even born. Um, things were different. Things were difficult. Things were hard, and so you got people that are traveling and they're they're going somewhere and they don't have any place to go, and they come they come to a group of Christians, and it would only behoove the Christians to help them and to take them in and to wash their feet and to give them something to eat and to help them uh, if they needed a place to stay for a period of time to stay there with them and to help them until they could be on their way. And I, I experienced a lot of this in Romania. Uh, a lot of times when uh, the, uh, when the uh, pastors come, um, they, they stay in the homes of the members of the, of the local church there. Uh, they stay with the members of Grace Church. And when you stay in somebody's home, which I have done, they wait on you hand and foot. It's amazing to me. I, I mean, I, I told them, I said, I don't deserve this. You know, they won't let you take, I, when, when, I, when I go somewhere, they won't let you take your luggage out of the car. You know, they, they, they take it out for you. They take it in. They, they, they just treat you like a king. It, it's really, uh, you know, they're almost offended if you try to help them. And so in the New Testament, they did not have what we would call these hotels and motels. They had some inns, and the problem with the inns is that they were notoriously evil. You wouldn't want to stay in an inn. And so part of the meaning of this word is that the elders are to be available to help people. You know, I think that that's probably the right way to look at it, is that you have to, you have, to have, if you're going to be in a position of leadership, you have to be willing to make the personal sacrifices that are needed to help people that need to be helped. I, listen, I, I believe in the ministry of the church. I don't think that the pastor or the elders are to do everything, but you still have to be a model for that to take place. They have to be approachable for people and willing to help when the need arises. Uh, obviously, you don't discard dis discernment. You don't just take that and just throw it away and say, well, I'll help you. You know, there, there's some plenty of cases, especially when dealing with strangers, and I think that would be very foolish, but especially in our day and time in which we live. The next phrase is that he's able to teach. This is the only qualification that relates specifically to a man's function, to his giftedness and function within the church. And in fact, this word only occurs in one other place in the New Testament. 2 Timothy 2.24, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, and patient. And so, you know, I've said it often, I, I would beat this drum and until I died. Uh, if you're going to be a student, of, if you're going to be somebody that teaches, you have to be a student. You have to be a student. The preparation, the sermon is just a tiny part of the preparation is where the real work actually 
occurs. And it, I think that this one gift is the one gift that separates an elder from everybody else, from, from, from the deacons. I'm not saying that deacons can't teach. I, we have deacons that teach. Um, but I'm not saying that. But what, what I am saying is that this is the one characteristic. This is the functional characteristic in the church. It's, I think by just having it here, it's one of those things that saying this is, we want this we want these people to be the primary teachers in our, in our church. Uh, not the only ones necessarily, but certainly the primary. That's the case in our church. I know in Dr. Sullivan's church that that is the case, that the pastors, the associate pastors, the elders, that they're the ones that teach the congregation. Uh, they're the ones that have the Bible studies. They're the ones that have the home groups. They're the ones that... that, that uh, that provide that fundamental uh, element in, in, in their church. Uh, most likely, I think the reason that this attribute is placed right in the middle of all the other attributes is because, I, I'm spiritualizing here, and I know that, uh, so just forgive me, but that, that, that uh, I think the reason is, is because effective teaching is, is kind of interwoven into the moral character uh, of the teacher, well, you know what a man is cannot be divorced from what he says or teaches. Uh, if, if you know whatever that man is, that's kind of what's going to come out of his life. That's what's going to come off of his lips. Uh, and I think that men that are gifted in the area of teaching, they are a gift to the church, and they need to be recognized as such. Uh, Ephesians chapter four. Uh, talks about, uh, you can read it there, I've got it written down for you, that God gave these men as gifts to the church so that they can build up the body of Christ and the, the body of Christ comes to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it, he teaches in such a way that his people are not tossed to and fro. Uh, you know, I'm doing a, a study now on the church and uh, I am particularly just started uh, in an area and um, uh, uh, that I'm teaching on in the area of gifts, the sign gifts in particular. And I told the church uh, when I first, uh, when I started that section of the teaching, I said, My, I want you to know up front, I'm being transparent with you. I'm not trying... To, I'm not trying to be arrogant about any of this, but my whole purpose is to expose. I want you to be well, uh, I, I want you to understand well what's not right uh, about some of these issues in, in under these sign gifts. And so uh, it talks here about not being tossed uh, to and fro with... Uh, Every wind of doctrine, the trickery of men, and the craftiness of deceitful plotting. Where do you think all that occurs? It occurs in the church. We're not talking about stuff that happens out here in the political arena. Obviously, that happens. We're talking about stuff that takes place in the church. In the church. And that's where the protection actually needed to, to occur. So, we want to be... We wanna be um, we, 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 we want to understand what this gift is. It's a spiritual enablement that's been given. You know, the word spiritual means of the Spirit. It's a gift that the Spirit of Christ has given to an individual to effectively communicate the truths of God's Word. And, and I think that someone who has this gift uh, should have a deep understanding of doctrine. It's the difference between just being able to teach and, and, uh, and being able to really integrate doctrine into your teaching. I, I think anybody who has this gift must have a, a deep understanding of doctrine. Uh, you, you cannot teach the truth if you don't know the truth. Paul told Timothy in chapter 4, verse 6 of 1 Timothy, if you instruct the brethren, Brethren, in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully 
followed. So the deeper, the reservoir of doctrinal knowledge that a man has, the more skilled and applicable will be his teaching. An elder must be a diligent student of scripture so that he can avoid error. There's a lot of error. There is a lot of error that, it, that exists in the church. And one of the most important attributes of a good teacher is that he has to have some strong and courageous convictions about uh, his life. And those things must be in alignment with God's word. He can never abandon the truth. The next attribute that we mentioned previously a little, little bit earlier is that the man cannot be given to wine. I don't think a, a man that drinks has any business being in the ministry. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people that would take issue with that. A lot of people in the ministry that drink, uh, but uh, not, 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 not this brother. And uh, I, I don't even think it's... Uh, you know, I think the problem is, I, I think the problem is, is that the way that wine was used in the New Testament, when, uh, you know, when the New Testament was written, is a lot different than the way that it was used today. Obviously, th there was a need for wine for the water, for the purification of the water and the drinking systems that they had, which were certainly, if you've ever, uh, when we go to Zimbabwe, they have wells and they have a bucket and they have a rope. And they pull that thing up and I don't have any idea how, how deep the wells are. Some of them, I'm sure the ones that, that, that are drilled, that where they have a hand pump are, are a little bit different, but the ones that just have the wells and, and they, there's no telling what's dropped down into that well. There's no telling what kind of bacteria are in that well, you know. Uh, and uh, there's no telling what kind of animals have, have gone down in, in, in there. And it's just one of those things that you have to be really, really careful about, um, about drinking the water. You just don't do it. It was that way in the New Testament. And, but we don't drink wine that way. We don't, in America especially, we don't, wine is, is a social drink. It, it's something that people drink for other reasons and for other purposes. Um, and so, you know, I think Timothy was inclined to some, he had some stomach ailments and Paul told him, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake, for your frequent infirmities. It's, you know, it's almost like he, it's like he had some kind of gas, you know, uh, uh, how would you say it, uh, some kind of gastro type issues in his stomach, gastrointestinal type issues. And, and, and Paul said, look, just take a little bit of wine for that. He didn't say get drunk. He didn't say drink a lot of wine, you know, just sit there and in, in, in the all night long. He, he didn't say that. He said, just, just take a little, you know, for your stomach ailments. This is one of those places, like we studied in 1 Timothy chapter 2, where in order to handle the Word of God accurately, you have to make the cultural transposition. There's a principle here. And that principle is doing something that's that's going to that that's going to remove your self-control um, and it, you have to make you have to understand the culture in which it was written and you know Paul was writing to a certain audience and when he wrote it they understood exactly what he was saying and uh, but in, in our audience today all thing we look at is the word wine and we we have missed the cultural transposition that's actually necessary for us to properly exegete this passage. If, if Paul were writing to our circumstances today, he would just simply have told Timothy, for instance, Timothy, you just need to go see the doctor and get some medicine for your stomach. That's what he would have said. You know, he said, look, you're sick, you need to go get some medicine for it. And uh, if he were speaking to some poverty-stricken natives in Africa, his instruction would be different. The principle here is that an elder is not to be given to one, not to be drunk, not to be somebody that's prone to, to, to drink. But there was a reason that he said that in the New Testament, because everybody had wine. Everybody had wine in their house. Everybody had wine because they had to have that as a part. You can just imagine some guy comes in and he's really tired and he knows that he can take the wine and he can 
drink it and it'll kind of help him just feel a little better. Uh, last night I wasn't, uh, I'd, I had worked out uh, side for a little bit and, and when I came in I was very tired and I, um, I, uh, uh, um, I, I took a couple ibuprofen, you know, my muscles were sore. I'd done some lifting and, and uh, I was just sore. I, I just can't do a lot of that anymore with, without it making me sore. And I took some ibuprofen. You know, um, you know, we just, you know, Paul said, look, just, you know, don't come in and just sit there and drink wine all night just because it's, because you have it there in, 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 your, in your house. He says, next that the uh, elder is uh, not to be violent. It, it literally means that he's not to get into fist fights. <laughs> I think that would be obvious. Uh, he ought to not be a reactionary, but he just respond to things calmly and gently and, you know, just move on. Uh, he has to learn to respond to difficult situations rather than react to them. The last thing he wants to do is, is, is to react to something that has taken place. He just has to be able to deal calmly uh, when, when tension arises. Next, he's not to be greedy for money. Uh, the love of money is the root motivation for all false teachers. If a person is a lover of money, then ultimately he will have a difficulty in being a lover of God. Well, you know, what an, what an incredible principle when you look at all of these false teachers out there and you look at the extravagance of their life their lifestyle. Some of these guys own these 12, 14 million dollar homes, these compounds where they have built, I mean these multi-million dollar homes, they have jets and just everything that goes along with what they do and they love money and if you you are a lover of money you you cannot love God at the same in the same way. So uh, once a leader's passions are divided, they will easily become distracted and ineffective. The next term is gentle. This word describes someone who is forbearing with others. Uh, you know, I think that the Bible actually talks about what I want to call a weaker brother, somebody who is a, a weaker brother. I think I think that those are, uh, I mean, they're legitimately or those kind of people um, and, and we have to be careful um, with them they they are weaker they uh, we, we had a, a, a man that lived with us uh, for a while and uh, he, he was just a weaker brother as I that's only we know how to put it he's still a, he's still a wonderful brother uh, we love him uh, we, we love him for a long time I mean we still love him and and uh, but we helped him in his life, and he just he just didn't have the same uh, spiritual strength that other people had. And I don't I think a lot of it had to do with his upbringing, and and uh, but he was faithful, you know. He 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 would never. He's the kind of guy you just love to death. I mean, he would do anything for you. Uh, he was a wonderful friend. Uh, he loved God. I mean, he loved the Word. Uh, he wasn't that intelligent. I mean, he, you couldn't carry on a long conversation with him, I mean, at, at, at a depth level, but he was still a wonderful brother in the Lord and somebody that uh, we loved and we, we loved having him in our, in our, in our home. And so you just got to uh, be considerate of where, I mean, you got to be gentle with people. Everybody's not at the same place. Every Christian is not at the level that you need to be at. And, and you have to recognize that. Uh, people are at different levels of growth in their spiritual life. And so you got to be willing to pardon a person's failure. Uh, I, have, I know, you know plenty of people that... Uh, I, I have a, uh, one man that I know particular uh, in our church, and he has some areas in his life that just need to be adjusted. That's the only way I know how to say it. And... I spend time with him and I love him to death, but he just needs some adjustment in some areas. And I'm willing, I recognize that. 
I, I recognize that. I'm not harsh on him. Uh, well, you know, we talk about these things uh, frequently, but I, he's still a good brother. He loves the Lord, and and uh, I just have to work through some of the issues with him at times. I, I think, uh, uh, you know, the word means that you don't hold a grudge or keep records. Um, I think... Uh, there are some men that uh, leave minist the ministry or they leave uh, their churches because they, they can't accept criticism. Uh, they just have trouble accepting criticism from other people. Uh, if you're going to be gentle, you have to accept some criticism. You, you have to. It's just, it's, just, it's just the nature of the beast. Uh, next, the leader is not quarrelsome. Uh, the, the term means peaceful or reluctant to fight. You know, I've, I've said it often, you've heard me say it, and in, in, it's, uh, it's one of those areas that I feel very strongly about. You have, to, you have to make some decisions as to which sword you're going to fall on or which hill you're willing to die on. Uh, you know, you just, I'm not saying that you violate your convictions about things because you don't, but you still have to know which battles are worth fighting. Uh, there's some battles that just aren't worth fighting. You, you know, the, the, the result, you know, the view's not worth the climb. It's just not worth it. So just don't, don't, don't start the climb. Once you create an issue in your church, it, it, it has to be resolved. And resolution is not something that everybody's going to like. And the next thing you know, you've got tension and people upset and leaving. And, and uh, you can't do that. You know, I don't make issues in my church. I just don't. Uh, they come up every once in a while, but I don't. I, I find a way to 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 to, to graciously avoid uh, getting on a hill that I don't want to die on. Uh, I, I think I've mentioned, you know, some of those things. I'm uh, every Easter the, they. You know, those that lead in the children's ministry, they love to have these Easter egg hunts. I'm not for that. I don't agree with that. I'm not, I don't, I just, I just somehow, it's not something that I, I, I don't care about the Easter bunny and Easter eggs and Astarte and everything that goes along with it. But the kids don't know the difference. And certainly I don't think that the intention of the, those that lead in that ministry, I don't think that their intentions are wrong. So it's not a hill that I'm even willing to climb on. Uh, you know, I'm not going to make an issue of it. It's just one of those things. It's just, hey, you go do it. <laughs> you just go do it. And, I mean, they, they don't even ask my opinion about it. They just go do it. Do I agree with it? No. Am I going to fall on that sword? Absolutely not. You know, you have got to make those kind of decisions. You can't just, you just can't just grind down about everything that happens and I'm going to be this way. It's going to be that way. That that won't get that that won't help you at all. So it says here, uh, uh, you know, if, if if a person is contentious in the ministry, uh, it always leads to disunity and disharmony. And and a man who is quarrelsome, who argues about everything, will just simply not be able to lead effectively. I, I don't like, I just do not like being around people that w want to contend about everything. I just don't like it, and I, I don't enjoy it, and, and um, I'm, I just I don't, just don't like it. And so, um, just have to be careful here. A man who's quarrelsome will not be able to lead effectively. May even divide his congregation. 2 Timothy 2. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they, they generate strife. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Titus chapter 3, verse 2, just it says, we're to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility. Probably, um, I think I'm going to stop there. Uh, the next has to do with uh, uh, the one who rules his own house well. And we'll, we'll talk about that in our next, in our next 
uh, in our next uh, session. Uh, I'll, I'll try to get through with all these uh, qualifications uh, uh, as quickly as I can um, so I can get to the controversial issue uh, about women in that passage there uh, about the deacons. God bless you. Hope you uh, are doing well. Uh, we have one more session. Thank you.